So uh, if you guys can get that up, uh, then I will go ahead and release the um, this particular recording um, <clears throat> because I feel like it's going to be very valuable. Um, but some of these questions may be used on the exam on for, or tomorrow. Uh, so that I'm not going to release the actual lecture um, uh, that I made for this. All right, so let's get started as we have a lot of slides to go over. So let's go ahead and uh, go over lecture one. I'm going to go through a lot of these really quick just because we have 16 lectures to get through. Um, at any point, if there is a question, either unmute yourself or go ahead and uh, message me in the chat, uh, and I'll go ahead and stop and reiterate any points. Um, <clears throat> but so for lecture one, we were talking about the um, uh, basically pro versus eukaryotic cells and the different organelles that are within them. Um, and so the one of the questions that uh, the majority of you guys got correct, um, but still missed a couple um, were, which of the following are single cell organisms? And so if you go back to my slide where I categorize both of the types of cells, we have two main kinds of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, where prokaryotic cells entail uh, archaea and bacteria, whereas eukaryotic cells are gonna be multicellular. And so examples of that are gonna be uh, fungi, protist, uh, plants, and us animal cells. Um, on the midterm, there were a few of you guys that missed this question. What unique part of bacteria facilitates the transfer of genetic material into an unrelated bacteria? And so whenever I'm asking certain questions, I'm usually very choosy and careful with the words that I pick uh, because I want it to be as specific as possible. Uh, and so, you know, utilize process of elimination when it comes to trying to uh, rationalize what the answer is. So when it comes to bacteria, they do not have a Golgi apparatus, nor do they have a nucleus. Um, so you're really left with two um, choices left, ribosomes or sex pili. Now, when we look at the different parts of the uh, uh, bacteria cell, um, we see that I highlighted this in, in the first lecture that these two unrelated bacteria are transferring genetic material to one another and that's via their pili. There's two kinds of pili. There's the sex pili and attachment pili. Sex pili are gonna facilitate that transfer of genetic material versus attachment pili is going to cause attachments to surfaces and, and cells. Um, so you know, be aware of that. Be aware of what is unique um, to the bacteria and what isn't and what can be found in plants versus animals. Um, and just as a reminder, understand the different parts of an animal cell and uh, what is specific to an animal sound. You know, a lot of these are color coded already, so you should be able to understand those. Same thing with plants, understand what's specific to plants, oops, and, um, and then you'll be good. Uh, the majority of the plasma membrane is made out of phospholipids. So the majority of you guys got this, but this is just gonna be one of those uh, talking points to help you guys remember some of these other parts. Uh, when I was making some of these quizzes originally, uh, you hadn't been exposed to some of these terms yet, like sugar chains and polypeptides, but now you guys are. So it may um, change in terms of what answer choices you pick. Just, you know, just think about the question um, and utilize process of elimination and utilize everything that you know. Um, I, I'm hoping that you guys realize a lot of my questions are pretty straightforward. Um, some can be a little bit more challenging because you have to think about them, um, but um, the majority are going to be fairly um, medium to easy. Um, and so just as a reminder, basically every living organism has a plasma membrane, and that's going to facilitate the transfer of uh, ions and whatnot, what goes in and out of a cell. Um, and then here is going to highlight the plasma membrane of animal cells, where we have mainly phospholipids that make up the structure, um, but you also are gonna have transporters that are going to facilitate the transport of molecules in and out of the cell. So here we have a sugar molecule coming into the cell. Um, and then there's sometimes gonna be these um, 
other kinds of proteins on the surface called receptors. And those receptors are going to facilitate different kinds of transduction mechanisms, which we didn't cover in this class. Uh, so what direction does DNA polymerase move? I will admit, I feel like I could have been a little bit more specific with this question. You will probably see it again, but more specific. Um, when I, whenever I refer to that, the majority of you guys understood what I meant. Um, but when it comes to synthesizing a new strand, the polymerase always moves from the five prime to three prime direction. Um, but when I guess when I asked this question, I, I, I wasn't specific. I didn't give you um, like context or a relation. Um, whenever I'm talking about DNA polymerase, it is moving from five prime to three prime. But if I if it was in relation to the template strand, then it's going to be the opposite of it. But usually when I'm asking this question, it's uh, in the form of it building. Um, and then here's an example of it building. So after primase adds the primer, um, the DNA polymerase can move from the five prime to three prime direction. And, uh, and it's going to be the opposite of the template strand. Um, Cell A and cell B are the same cell type and are both healthy. So this is, when I say this, this you can already rule out this is not cancer because they're healthy. A cancer cell is not healthy. Um, given that cell A has longer telomeres than cell B, which has replicated more? And I got a few questions about this. And I love it when students ask me, oh, I think you gave me the wrong answer on there. No, usually I'm pretty good about on the exam to not put wrong answers. The whole point of this kind of question is more for a concept. And if we go back to the telomeres at the ends of the chromosomes, basically after every round of replication, your telomeres are gonna get shorter and shorter. So the more times you've replicated, the shorter your telomeres are going to be. And so basically you have to pick the cell type that um, has shorter telomeres and that's how you're going to be able to figure out which cell has replicated more. And so in the question, it tells me that cell A has longer telomeres, indicating that cell B has shorter telomeres. If it has shorter telomeres, then it's replicated more. That's why it's cell B. Uh, midterm question, what kind of bonds are formed when connecting the DNA uh, backbone? So this is going to be what connects the sugar, or sorry, the sugar to the phosphate not the base pairs, not the nucleotides. And so the majority of the people got this answer correct. Um, but the, you know, I think it was recall, um, they, they thought hydrogen bonds, but again, that's between the nucleotides. So if we go back to some of my slides, when I'm highlighting the different parts of uh, the structure of uh, a DNA strand, we see that this polynucleotide um, has the nucleotides, the um, phosphate group, and then the sugar. And so the parts that are connecting from the five prime to three prime end are gonna be connected through these phosphodiester bonds. And that's just phosphoric acid interacting with the uh, OH or hydroxyl groups on the sugar. Um, whereas the uh, nitrogenous bases, when you have two strands sticking together, uh, then you're going to um, end up uh, forming the hydrogen bonds, and that's how the basically the rung of or the the ladders, um, or yeah, the the steps or the rungs of the ladder are going to connect. Um, what molecule uh, does mRNA need to have attached to it to make it stable before it leaves the nucleus? And so this all goes back to what happens before um, RNA is exported out of the nucleus. So um, the RNA I've emphasized multiple times is very, the RNA is very unstable. So <clears throat> basically in order to make it stable, there's a couple of things that need to happen to it. Um, and that's going to have the uh, five prime G cap and the three prime polyadenylated tail. And that's why these answers are, they are. And there's a couple of other things that occur to basically make the RNA more uh, condensed so the um, <clears throat> ribosomes can go ahead and translate it more efficiently. So this is a question that I want to spend a little bit more time on because uh, I do feel people are uh, struggling to answer some of these. 
Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the majority of the people got the answer right, but it wasn't by a lot. Um, and so when you answer these questions, you kind of have to think a little bit abstract. And so the question is, what amino acid does a transfer RNA with an anticodon GCC carry? And so when you um, think about this question, you need to consider the structure of the transfer RNA. So here we have the transfer RNA that carries an amino acid. And at the bottom of it are the anticodons. And the anticodons are what going to bind to the codons on the mRNA. And so um, when you're using the genetic code to decipher this, this anticodon needs to be converted to a codon first before you can decipher it. And so a lot of people, when they answer this, they just use the genetic code uh, to look up GCC and they ended up getting alanine. And that's why I ended up putting this answer here because I wanted to make sure you guys are being able to distinguish the differences between the two. Um, so here in this question, I, uh, I think I made it a bit easier to go ahead and kind of color code it. Um, so it makes more sense. So the amino acid present on here that's attached to the transfer RNA uh, has this specific um, anticodon. And so in order to answer this question, you need to generate the codon. Once you generate the codon, then you can utilize the genetic code to figure out what the answer is. Um, so it's a little bit of a puzzle, um, but it's very straightforward. So we can go ahead and go through these really quick. So when you look at um, the anticodon that's on this transfer RNA, you when you uh, convert this to the codon, it's going to be GAU. And so when we look at GAU using the genetic code, we go GAU and it's aspartic acid. So that is going to be B. Um, when we look at the anticodon for ACC, when we translate that, that's going to be UGG. Uh, so when we use the code, we go UGG, and that's tryptophan. So that's going to be what the answer is. And then, you know, just to further solidify this, when we look at the anticodon UCA, um, uh, we're going to end up uh, converting this, and once we convert it, it's going to translate into serine. Um, if you guys have any questions about that, now is the time to ask, but I'm hoping that with this color coding scheme, it'll make more sense and hopefully you'll be able to um, uh, understand these questions and you won't miss them. They're very easy points. Um, all right. So another question I got on this one a lot, uh, got a couple of emails of people telling me that I messed up the answer. Uh, so the original codon U was UAA. A mutation in the DNA led this codon to change to UAG. What type of mutation is this? And so you need to basically figure out what each of these codons translates to. And so when you translate them, they both are stock codons. So I'm assuming when people miss this, a lot of people ended up just translating the second one. And so the second one's going to be a stop codon. So you're going to think it's a nonsense mutation, um, but that is not the case. Uh, and so I think I put that same question on the exam and 10% of the people ended up not getting it from, from originally when we had like 82% that got it. Uh, so let's go ahead and quickly go over some point mutations. So, <clears throat> Basically, with any kind of, or if there's a, a sequence that has no mutation in it, it's going to translate as its respective amino acid. So here we have DNA that's translated to RNA, and this encodes cysteine. Now, when a point mutation occurs because of some issue, DNA damage, or the um, something was off with the replication uh, machinery, uh, a point mutation can be generated. And so depending on the kind of point mutation that is present is going to determine the type of mutation that exists. And so if the point mutation doesn't change the end result of the amino acid, then it's going to be a silent mutation. And so if we go back here, this was a stop codon 
And when the point mutation occurred, it stayed a stop codon. So that's why the answer is silent. When you have a point mutation that changes the amino acid altogether, then you're going to end up getting a missense mutation. So this is just going to be a complete change of what the actual amino acid was. Now, when you had an amino acid that was present, such as cysteine, and then a point mutation ends up resulting in a stop codon, then that is going to lead to a nonsense mutation. So this is just a stop codon that's being uh, made because of a point mutation in an amino acid that was originally supposed to encode some amino acid, but now is a stop. Now, this is very different than a frame shift mutation. A frame, frame shift mutation is a uh, is also a type of point mutation that actually depends on how many amino acids are really um, deleted. Um, but what ends up happening with a point mutation or sorry, a frame shift mutation is um, you can either add in a nucleotide or two or delete a nucleotide or two. And when, as we all remember, when it comes to the translating these um, codons into amino acids, they are all in units of three. There's always three letters that equate to some amino acid. Now, if you have an added or deleted nucleotide or two, that's going to shift the sequence a bit. And when you shift the sequence a bit and your, um, <clears throat> your uh, host machinery to translate uh, is trying to translate everything, those amino acids are going to change the whole sequence downstream. And so instead of having the original protein sequence, we can see that adding one or deleting a nucleotide will change all of the amino acids downstream. And that is what's known as a frame shift mutation. And I'll go ahead and emphasize this now, but I'll go ahead and emphasize it when we're talking about the CRISPR-Cas system. The CRISPR-Cas system utilizes a frame shift mutation. Basically, what ends up happening is a double-stranded break will happen in the DNA, and then the host cell machinery will try to repair it. But in the process of repairing, it ends up just trying to throw in a couple of nucleotides. It'll either delete some nucleotides or add in some nucleotides, and in that process ends up causing a frame shift. And a lot of the time in those kinds of mutations, a frame shift will create a premature stop codon. And so instead of reading the whole sequence, um, the amino acid um, or the, the sequence will end up coding encoding for a stop codon, say in the middle or at the beginning of the, the sequence and the protein won't get translated fully. And if it's not translated fully, then um, it's going to end up getting degraded when it's being packaged and sent off to the Golgi apparatus. Um, here's just a summary of the different nucleotides. Remember the differences between purines and primidines. Um, understand that concept of five prime to three prime and what that means. Uh, understand the main differences between um, the sugar groups that are in RNA versus DNA. Understand the nucleotides that are different amongst them and a couple of other key things that I've already highlighted um, in the lecture. Um, lecture four. So this was a midterm question that people um, didn't all get right. So I asked you what kind of my microscopy was, was taken to generate this image. And so when I talked about how viruses are so small, we need a special kind of electron microscope to do this, but there's two kinds that do this. You have scanning electron microscopy, which is going to show you the surface or the outside of whatever you're looking at. And so for this, you, this is what uh, kind of images are typically generated from a scanning electron microscope. You can see the overall shape of whatever they're trying to um, take a picture of versus a transmission electron micros uh, microscope image. Um, that's going to go a little bit deeper into whatever you're trying to image, and that's usually going to take some kind of cross-section of whatever you're trying to do, and that generates, generates going to look like this kind of image. And so with that knowledge, now you can go ahead and utilize that. If you remember the differences between scanning and transmission, the scanning is always going to give you those really beautiful images of 
basically they look like 3D images of objects versus transmission. They're usually more of a, a two dimension. Uh, light microscopy is typically what scientists uh, will use when they're just looking at cells without anything on them. I don't think I even talked about light microscopy in, in this lecture. And for sure, I did not talk about fluorescent microscopy. Um, for that kind of microscopy, you need fluorescent antibodies to recognize your stuff. And then you shine lasers onto those uh, antibodies that have a, um, a color attached to them so we can actually visualize them. Um, so be familiar with these two. You may get a question like that again. Uh, lecture five, uh, coronavirus antivirals do not do which are the following. Uh, the majority of you guys got these right. And so when we look at the main parts that antivirals target, they're typically going to target some mechanism that the virus uses to either gain entry uh, into the host cell or to uh, end up generating proteins by hijacking the host cell machinery or by um, utilizing some parts of the cell in order to um, leave the, um, the cell. And so antivirals are going to target only those things versus um, uh, anti-inflammatories, they're going to target more of the host cell itself, preventing them from producing uh, different kinds of pro-inflammatory cytokines. What are the two main parts of the spike protein that facilitates entry into the cell? And so I highlighted this um, because it's very important to understand how this works. When it comes to the spike protein, there's basically two parts that exist to it. There's the binding domain, and then there's the fusion domain. In the process of the virus binding to the ACE2 receptor, um, then once that binding happens, there's a lot of conformational changes where the protein basically changes its structure and opens up. So the um, fusion domain ends up opening up and it's able to fuse with the membrane. Be familiar with the different kinds of proteins that are involved with uh, the structure of the coronavirus uh, and note the kind of genome it has. Lecture six, uh, what is the name of the enzyme that bacteriophages use to lyse out of cells? Uh, and this one's a very straightforward one. It's going to be lysin when it um, is in the lysogenic phase. Um, basically, once it's replicated enough, it's going to use those enzymes to break open the cell wall. Um, the people that put lysogen, this is going to be part of the lysogenic pathway um, that you should be familiar with uh, along with the lytic pathway. Um, antibiotics are used to kill what organisms? And um, a lot of the time when I have select all apply and I don't tell you how many, it's because I'm expecting you to actually know how many things you're supposed to select. And the majority of you guys got this right. Um, I know for the exam, I think everybody got this right, because uh, I emphasize it so many times, but during the first round, I'm, I'm going to guess the people that got this wrong were people that uh, didn't watch the lecture or go to lecture. Um, here are key parts that antibiotics typically affect when it comes to preventing the bacteria from being able to replicate. Uh, bacteriophages hijack what part of the cell during the lysogenic cycle to make productive protein. And so the key thing to be able to really get this answer is I'm referring to productive protein and there's only one key part of the cell that is able to do this and that is going to be the ribosome. So again, bacteria do not have any nucleuses uh, or nuclei, I think it's the plural. Um, <clears throat> they do have plasmids, but uh, the bacteriophages do not do anything with the plasmid. They incorporate their genome into the nucleoid. Um, and then the cell wall is what they use to get in and lice out of the cell. And so just be familiar again with the bacteriophage lytic and lysogenic cycle. With the lytic cycle, basically once the virus deposits its genome, then uh, it's going to end up degrading uh, the DNA in the host. And then from that, it's going to hijack the host ribosomes um, so it can go ahead and start generating productive virus. Once enough productive virus is made, then it's going to basically break this open. Now, with the lysogenic cycle, which the question was asking about, you kind of had to 
you know, critically think a bit. So again, the part that I was talking about productive protein, that is going to be your main key to uh, do, uh, answer that question. But you also want to consider the process of the um, bacteriophage trying to integrate its uh, DNA with the, um, <clears throat> with the host cell genome. And so in order to do this, the viral enzyme, which is a protein, needs to be made first before it can even do this. And so in order to do this, a sequence is going to encode for this enzyme and it's going to be utilizing the ribosome so it can synthesize this and then allow for this integration process to happen. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system uh, knock out a, knocks out a gene by creating a premature stop codon. What kind of mutation is this? And so <clears throat> I already went over this once, but just to highlight this. So I think you guys did well during the lecture quiz, but then some of you guys ended up changing your answers for this for some reason. Um, but, you know, you want to remember that we utilize this system or we exploited it from bacteria. Bacteria, um, this is their version of their immune system. So when the, uh, during the lysogenic phase of infection, the um, bacteria is able to incorporate some of the viral DNA into this thing called a CRISPR array. Once the bacteria realizes that there's some kind of infection going on, um, it's going to end up upregulating this CRISPR array, which it only composes of uh, short RNA sequences. Um, <clears throat> uh, and that is going to, uh, is it RNA or DNA? I, I think it's DNA, sorry. Uh, DNA sequences that are um, going to be complementary to different uh, sequences in the viral genome. And so when it recognizes that, it upregulates these, pro uh, these, sorry, these sequences as well as the Cas proteins. And the Cas proteins have uh, nuclease activity. And that means it can, a nuclease activity means that it can break down nucleic acids. And so um, once this CRISPR array is fragmented into single guide RNA, um, the single guide RNA are going to bind to the Cas proteins, scan the incoming genetic material of the bacteriophage. And then once it uh, uh, cuts it, it's going to render the bacteria phage, phage's DNA useless. And so when we're talking about it in the context of how we utilize this, we basically have uh, two systems, a knockout system or a knock-in system. When um, we are talking about the knockout system, um, in this process, you have your uh, Cas9, which is highlighted in yellow, and your single guide RNA scanning your uh, DNA segment of interest. Once it binds to your DNA segment of interest, the Cas9 protein will cleave this. And then um, in this process, your body has a lot of good um, host cell machinery to try to repair the DNA. But in that process, it's going to end up trying to um, fill in the um, uh, this cut segment with random nucleotides. Um, and sometimes it'll end up taking out some of those nucleotides instead. And so that's what an indel mutation is. So it's an insertion deletion mutation. And so in this process, when you're adding in nucleotides, you're taking out nucleotides. And if you're doing only one or two of them instead of a, a whole section of three, then this is going to lead to a frame shift. The frame shift is going to typically lead to a premature stop codon. If there's a premature stop code on that means the whole protein cannot get synthesized, thus the protein is knocked out. Versus the knock-in system, you need a bunch of other extra things in there, which you know I'm not going to end up asking you. Um, and then just this is a here a, a close-up of um, this protein. So you have the Cas9 in yellow. Again, it has enzymatic activity that is going to create the double-stranded break. This is um, going to be held together with a scaffold protein highlighted in red that is attached to a complementary sequence um, that is going to be complementary to the target DNA of interest or whatever gene you're trying to um, uh, get rid of. Um, and then once this binds, then you're going to uh, get rid of the... Um, which I'm call you're going to end up uh, doing this one second. My cat is.
All right. You guys want to see the cat? Uh, I'll show you one of them. We have we have too many. We have three. Um, let's see. Can you guys see that one that's sleeping right here? Uh, that's Jasper. Uh, mittens is somewhere else. And then the one that's crying is Raven. All right. Um, let's continue. Lecture seven. Uh, so this one was the epidemiology lecture. We were focused on uh, basically emphasizing how disease spreads and how we're able to lower the curve. And I'm glad nobody put antibiotics for this. So I'm, you know, you guys are understanding. Um, but the thing that people mainly missed were the vaccines. So vaccines are going to be, um, and you know, now that you guys have had the vaccine lecture, you guys won't miss this if you were to see this again, because this is imperative in breaking that chain. Um, <clears throat> lecture eight, uh, what would happen if you were infected with a pathogen, but did not have an innate immune system? And so, uh, you know, I'm hoping that you guys have a, a good understanding of the immune system, now, both the innate and the adaptive. Um, and so to answer this question, let's go ahead and review um, some, uh, some things on this. So here in the yellow line is going to be when you have both branches of the immune system. You have the innate that's going to recognize the pathogen, and then it's going to basically sound the alarms. Once the alarms are sounded, then it can go ahead and educate your adaptive immune system so it can go and kill off the specific pathogen. And so once that ends up occurring, then you get peak level of microorganisms in your body, and then eventually it gets cleared. When you lack the adaptive immune system, um, you have the innate immune system intact. And so again, those are gonna be the first um, line of defense. Well, your skin and stuff's first line of defense, but in the context of, of the immune system, um, those are gonna be the first ones that recognize the pathogen. And um, so, you know, you have macrophages and they're trying to eat things up, uh, but because they're only able to recognize some of the pathogen, um, but the, the type of response that innate immunity has isn't very specific, it's very broad. Uh, whereas the adaptive is very specific. And so if you, never, if you don't have um, the adaptive immune cells, then you're never gonna be able to fully clear off the infection uh, because you always have your, um, uh, innate immune cells trying to kill off whatever's there, trying to eat whatever's present. Um, but because you don't have that specific immunity from your adaptive immune cells, then you never cleared. So you basically have chronic or lifelong infection. Um, whereas what the question was asking, what happens when you lack your innate immune system? Well, if you don't have those first responders to sound the alarms, you can never educate your adaptive immune cells. Your adaptive immune cells need your innate immune cells to help educate it. And so um, what ends up happening is you end up getting high levels of microorganisms in your body. And because you have no adapt, uh, innate immune cells being able to clear any of this or educate the adaptive immune system, the amount of organisms is going to be so great that your body cannot handle it. And that then you will end up succumbing to the infection. And so that's why uh, the answers here are uh, the level of microorganisms grow exponentially uh, and you're more likely to die. How can innate immune cells see foreign pathogens? And you guys did pretty well on this, um, but this is just as a reminder, understand these different um, terms and, and receptors. And this just is gonna highlight the different parts of what those are. These are kind of interchangeable, but they're you know kind of specific to what whatever they're referring to. Toll-like receptors are an example of uh, pattern recognition receptors and pattern recognition receptors recognize pathogen associated molecular patterns. So basically conserve sequences on uh, viruses, bacteria, worms, or whatever, and, um, and they'll recognize that that will end up sounding the alarms. Lecture nine of the, we're talking about the adaptive immune system here. Um, where is a site in the body where adaptive immune cells are presented with antigen? And so 
with this, you guys did pretty well, um, but let's go ahead and review some of these things as primary lymphoid organs um, were selected for this answer. So when we're talking about primary lymphoid organs, this is where your immune cells are going to develop. And so here highlighted in um, yellow are your two primary lymphoid organ. You're going to have the bone marrow where all of your white and red blood cells are generated, but your T cells get sent off to the thymus to, uh, and at that, at that point when they're leaving the bone marrow, they're called thymocytes. They're not called T cells yet. Um, the thymocytes will end up going to the thymus where they will basically further mature. And there's a whole long process with that, which we definitely do not need to go over. Um, that basically uh, select for uh, uh, and differentiate uh, T cells into mature T cells. So then once they leave, then they can go ahead and go to their secondary lymphoid organs, which are all highlighted in blue here. And so that's why these three answers are the answers they are. Okay. Uh, and then here's just an example of uh, an innate, uh, sorry, innate immune cell talking to an adaptive immune cell in a lymph node. Um, so what part of the body uh, is recognized by the innate immune system? So, that's it. What part of the antibody? Yeah. Uh, so let's go ahead and review antibody structure really quick. So the parts that I really want you to be aware of are the variable region, which is what's going to bind to the um, antigen or, or foreign pathogen. Um, and then your FC portion is what your innate immune cells are going to bind to. And they have these things called FC receptors. So here I have a macrophage expressing an FC receptor when there's antibody that binds to free floating pathogen, such as a um, virus, then it can basically bind to that FC portion and phagocytose it so it can get destroyed. Uh, lecture 10, how are we doing on time? Okay, not bad. Uh, this talk, this lecture was focused on the different uh, testing we have for COVID. Um, and so I think you guys understood this pretty well, but this is just for a reminder. I want you guys to really understand these different terms, true positive versus true negative, false positive versus false negative, and be able to associate um, these terms, if I were to give you specific data, such as sensitivity and specificity data. Um, and so just to reiterate some of these points, when we're, we're, when we're talking about sensitivity, we're talking about the accuracy of the test that identifies true positives. And so with that, you're going to have, if it's not 100% sensitive, then that means that you're gonna get some X percentage that is gonna generate false negatives, meaning, the person should have been tested positive for something, but the test wasn't sensitive enough to detect it. Um, so here in this example, a true positive would be 95%, whereas the false negative would be 5%. And so you would utilize the sensitivity number to uh, figure out these particular terms. Um, and then when we're talking about specificity, we're seeing how accurate the test is at identifying true negatives. And so, um, if the test isn't very specific, what's gonna end up happening is um, people that are not actually infected or whatever the test is, uh, is going to uh, come back positive. And so that's what a false positive is. So when we're looking at the term, so if I'm asking you uh, for this particular test, uh, what it, what's the level of the true negatives that will come back, it's gonna be 90%. Whereas I would ask you, what is the false positive rate then it's going to be 10%. Um, and then I showed you guys this question in lecture, um, and this is um, going to um, help you with uh, associating these particular terms with the uh, other key terms that you should understand and know. Which of the following tests for COVID can tell you if you have had previous infection? And so let's go ahead and quickly review these three main tests. So we have the uh, RT-QPCR test, which is just going to amplify um, uh, RNA or, uh, yeah, the RNA or COVID genome. Um, and this is basically to test if you currently have the infection. If you do not have any virus in you, then the QPCR will not detect anything. 
Uh, and this is the best kind of test that you can get because if you compare the sensitivity and specificity, it's quite high compared to the other ones. I would say the sensitivity is probably a little bit more important uh, because you don't want people that are um, infected and not knowing that they're infected because they're their test came back negative and going out and spreading it. I rather have people who think that they're positive, but actually negative so they can actually stay home and not spread it. Um, when we're talking about the antigen test, we're looking at the surface antigens. And this again is also going to show you if you have current infection. This is only going to be detected if you have active virus in you. Um, and so go back through this lecture and you know understand some of the caveats to um, this particular test, all of them really, but this one has a very low sensitivity. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, when we're talking about the antibody test, so this is now that we have um, immunity or the immune system has responded to the virus. And so there are gonna be two main antibodies um, that are going to indicate either active infection or cleared infection, and that's going to be IgM and IgG, respectively. So during IgG, uh, you're going to have, sorry, during IgM, that's going to be the first round of antibody that's produced against the pathogen, but it's not, it doesn't bind to it super well, so it has low affinity or low magnetism, as I've been trying to, you know, compare the, uh, to make sense of the word. Um, but, uh, and that's why it usually comes as a pentamer. Whereas once there, there's something called isotype class switching, um, then the uh, antibody becomes a lot more specific in that and is able to bind to the pathogen of interest a lot more efficiently. And so typically, if you don't have any IgM present in the blood and just IgG, testing for that's, that's against COVID, then um, that's going to indicate that you've had previous infection. So that's why IgG antibody test is the answer for this. Lecture 11. Uh, during a secondary immune response to a pathogen, select all that apply. And so um, here is how you're going to be able to answer this. So I've gone through this a couple of times. So, uh, you know, there's this delay of innate talking to the adaptive. Usually it's about approximately five to seven days um, once that um, uh, the adaptive immune cells are educated, then it can go and clear the pathogen. So that's going to be your primary immune response. You generate a primary immune response as well when you get vaccinated. So because it thinks you have a pathogen, but because it's not actual active virus, it's not going to make you as sick. But there are some people that experience symptoms after a vaccine because your immune system is responding to it. That's a good thing if you have symptoms. Um, now, and so in the, this whole process, you generate a set of memory cells, a set of memory B and T cells. And so because you don't have that five-day delay um, and allowing the virus to replicate, once you get a secondary exposure, either because you've been vaccinated or because you've already had the infection before, your uh, your memory cells are going to be more sensitive to the particular pathogen. And so in that process, it's going to um, uh, end up being a lot quicker when it's created. So look at this long response versus this short response. And it's going to be in greater magnitude. So look at the amount of concentration of antibody during a primary response versus a secondary response. You have a whole lot more that is being produced. And so that's why when we look at the answers, the immune response is faster and the immune system is stronger compared to the primary immune response. It is not weaker. Um, be familiar with the three main kinds of vaccines that I went over and understand how they work. Uh, lecture 12, I think this is starting to talk about nutrition. This is a nutrition intro. So which of the following is not an enzyme that breaks down protein? And so you guys did great on this, uh, but this is just a talking point to kind of remember. We haven't been able to tell I love my enzymes and I love my structures because those are so important when it comes to how things biochemically reacts. 
Um, and so be familiar with the ones that are involved in breaking down these respective macromolecules. Uh, lecture 13, uh, when your blood sugar level is low, which hormone signals to deliver to release sugar storages? And so this is going to be a difference between insulin versus glucagon. So you have to understand these differences. Um, so these two are going to regulate the amount of sugar that's in the blood, but one is going to have a drastic different effect than the other. So, you know, after you eat a meal that is heavy in carbs or just carbs in general, um, your body is going to need to process it. And so the way it's going to process it is by secreting insulin. So the whole point of this is for insulin to signal to your cells um, to open up your glucose transporter so you can take all of that sugar that's in the blood and put it into your cells so they can use it for energy. Um, this hormone is going to be secreted by your uh, beta islet cells here in the pancreas. Um, and so uh, the whole point of this is to lower the amount of blood sugar that is in your blood. Now, when you haven't eaten for some time, um, again, your body runs on carbs and needs sugar to function. That's what your brain typically functions off of. It also functions off of ketones, but that's usually in an unhealthy situation. You really want it to be um, your, um, what you call it? You really want it to be sugars, glucose. And so once your um, glucose levels in your blood end up lowering, you end up um, producing this hormone called glucagon. And glucagon is gonna be secreted by your alpha islet cells in your pancreas. And that is gonna tell the liver, release that glycogen, break it down so it can be into those simple sugars that your body can absorb. Um, so we can go ahead and return to homeostatic levels. Um, Really understand the differences between type one and type two diabetes. I think you guys did well on the questions for this. Type one is gonna be autoimmunity versus type two is gonna be because we have a shitty diet. Understand how we test for this. Understand this whole process of how an A1C test works um, and understand if you were to get some numbers, are you considered pre-diabetic? And the reason why I have you guys want to know these, uh, understand these tests is because you sometimes get them during your blood work. And so it's important to understand what these numbers mean and how this test is actually working. Uh, lecture 14, uh, this type of lipid is composed of many rings and plays a role in hormone synthesis. So I think you, uh, not everyone has completed the quizzes for this week. Uh, if you guys don't complete them, you, you do have until Friday to do them, but I will say you will be at a disadvantage if you don't have them done. Think of this as practice questions for the exam. Um, so you guys, the ones that did take this did well on this. Uh, this is just a slide to uh, get, highlight the different kinds of lipids that are present. Um, basically, you're gonna have mainly triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. They all have different functions and what they do, but the main key conserved molecule they have in all of them are fatty acids. So typically the fatty acids are gonna be these long chains, um, and depending if they have kinks in them is going to uh, indicate that they're unsaturated, meaning they don't have as many hydrogens attached. Um, but when it comes to steroids, such as cholesterol, um, those fatty acids are going to change their shape a bit, and they're going to be um, these fused carbon rings. Lecture 15, uh, select all vitamins that are antioxidants. And so for this answer, it was everything. And the whole point of this was because I want you guys to understand the different names for these vitamins. So you guys have all heard of like vitamin E, A, all of these that have vitamin and some letter to them. But it's also important to note their scientific name because on the back of a lot of food packaging, uh, if they have any of these vitamins, they're typically going to be in this name. And so you really want to be familiar with those as I'm, I, I will use those interchangeably sometimes. And it's for me to under, make sure that you have an understanding of those kinds of terms. Um, I already highlighted all of the main uh, micronutrients, just to be familiar with the different kinds of fat and water soluble vitamins and the different minerals that I highlighted in um, that last lecture. Uh, lecture 16, um, why is it mistakenly thought that vaccines cause autism? 
And for this answer, it was all of them. So we have this disgraced uh, scientist, if you can call him that, um, who falsified data. He had a conflict of interest because lawyers were paying him while uh, the lawyers are trying to fight court cases uh, for parents that were fighting against a vaccine producing companies that um, ended up, they, they thought that the vaccines led to autism and his work uh, supposedly showed that, but after, you know, true analysis of it, the, um, uh, it was shown that it was fake. And so another reason why people, uh, you know, say that uh, vaccines cause autism is because of the mercury that's in there. And I emphasize this in that lecture that it's not mercury by itself that's in there. It's in the thiomersinol, uh, myrosol uh, form of it. And so this form we can easily excrete. That's why when I show you guys the shapes of these, the shapes are very important when it comes to how we are able to biologically process them and excrete them. They do not bioaccumulate in our bodies. And so that's why when you look at all the answers, um, the anti-vaxxers will promote that the mercury in there is gonna cause the uh, autism and then all these other things that are re relevant to Andrew Wakefield. Um, so that is a quick review. So that took about an hour. Um, do not be surprised if you see any of these questions again. Um, I, if you weren't able to gauge, I did recycle a couple of questions um, from the, uh, for the midterm from the lecture quizzes. I'm probably going to do the same. Um, it's, but, and some of them are probably gonna be here because these are the ones that people missed. So really have an understanding of these. Um, with that, I will take any questions from people. Um, and if not, you guys are free to go. Um, we need, if you guys want me to release this recording, um, you need to, I need to get 80%. And uh, if I don't get that 80% and, and all of you here who haven't done it, you know, you can help get that to 80%. There's enough of you guys here. Um, and so, no, the slides will not be posted because some of these questions will end up being used for the exam. And I don't want you guys trying to search for them for the answer. I want you guys to have an understanding of these things. Um, but I will post a lecture if you guys want to um, watch it again uh, and take notes, but only if you guys make it to that 80%. So tell your classmates. Um, and if you guys don't make it, well, sorry. Uh, any questions for me? And if not, you know, good luck on the exam tomorrow. Uh, I think you guys will do fine. You guys did really well on the midterm. I'm expecting you guys to do really well on the final. Um, yes, uh, somebody asked, could we use our own notes from this session for the final? Absolutely. Those are your notes. You took them. Um, go ahead and take them. But, you know, if you want to watch this again and take some more notes, tell your classmates to send in their evals. Today is the last day to do that. Um, so, yep. Any questions for me? Anything that you guys had trouble understanding or feel like was unfair or anything? Good, good. I'm glad you guys learned a lot of stuff. Yep, yep. My pleasure, everybody. It was fun teaching this class. Um, let's see for Yvonne, for the screen share, I have two monitors, one with my notes and, uh, show me the one with your notes. Um, just so, so I'm assuming you're going to have one, um, that's strictly only for the final. So you can visualize everything in another one where you're trying to like go over all your notes. All right. Just show uh, when you're screen sharing, show the one with your notes, just so we know that you're only using class notes. That's the whole point of have me having people screen share so I can 
um, make sure that people aren't cheating and Googling answers. Um, but yeah, feel free to use it and you'll do fine on the exam. Ryan, did you have any questions for me? Uh, I'm good, man. Okay, cool, cool. All right, all right. Well, I will see you all tomorrow at 8 a.m. And uh, I will, I'm still working on the exam. I'm gonna end up posting it at some point. It's gonna take me some time, but um, yep. We'll start it at eight o'clock. There is one student that is taking it at seven tomorrow. I need to verify that you're still doing that. Um, so I'll be on already. Um, but once people are in, I'm gonna put them into random breakout groups. Great, tomorrow, 8 a.m. Perfect. All right, see you guys later. Thank you. All right, thank you.